Naveen, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions sure. first about um, sort of the turnaround that you affected at the company at uh, Jindal Steel and Power. You are credited with really kind of taking a moderately running business, right, uh, a factory in, in fact, and really turning it into a star performer. So tell us a little bit about what were the key drivers of that turnaround? Okay, when I, um, after completing my MBA uh, from University of Texas at Dallas, uh, I went straight from uh, Dallas, Texas to Raigad in uh, Madhya Pradesh at that time. It was um, middle of uh, nowhere. And this uh, steel division of uh, Jindal Strips Limited, one of our flagship company, was making uh, huge losses. And uh, it was making losses like around uh, 15, 20 million dollars uh, every month, every, every year, sorry. And my father you know, said, no, don't worry, this company will make at least uh, 25 uh, million profit per annum. And I couldn't believe him. I said, a company making, you know, 15, 20 million uh, losses, how the hell is it going to make it uh, 25 million uh, dollar profit uh, every year? But then I worked and worked. It has all been team effort. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, I never done anything. I mean, no one can do anything alone. So it has been team effort. Uh, my father kept on uh, guiding me, uh, kept on giving me the courage to, to go ahead. And every time I would be in despair, I would go and speak to him and he would encourage me to do it. And then slowly, slowly things changed and uh, we were able to start getting good production. Then the markets changed, steel started to do really well. Then we uh, changed the company. We, from a, we hyped off the division into a separate company called Jindal Steel and Power Limited. Mm -hmm. And then we have never really looked back. We, uh, even during the downturn, Jindal Steel and Power paid all its interest payments, repayments on time, every time. So we built an impeccable uh, track record uh, for the company. And now then we set up uh, India's first mega power project, first 1,000 megawatt project, power project in the private sector. So we implemented that. Now uh, Jindal Steel and Power has uh, the highest market capitalization of any steel company in the private sector in India. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to do it with a team effort of the inter all the people working in the company. And I would just say that God has been very kind to us. And the kind of policies, we realized there was an extreme shortage of power in the country, mm -hmm. electricity. So we set up uh, a power plant which is doing exceedingly well. Whatever products, steel, uh, the, nobody was making uh, large sized parallel flange beams. So we started to make beams, we started to make uh, plates in bigger sizes. Always tried to make products which there was, a, there was a demand for, there was a shortage for, to be able to meet up that demand. And that really helped us. So it sounds like from what you're saying that you really kind of had a strategy to um, really uh, service the domestic market, right, where there was going to be that yes. kind of demand for the long steel products that you manufacture. And also, um, it looks like you're doing a lot of integration, backward and forward integration, um, you know, in, in the business. So can you talk a little about that? You're um, going, I mean, you have some mining stuff, right, uh, coal and ore and stuff like that, um, and um, that's really helped sort of stabilize your business, while some of the other steel companies have really been hit by the downturn. Right, uh, you're right. Uh, it's very, very important to have control over the key raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have, we do not control all the raw materials, but say uh, to the tune of 60 to 70 percent, uh, raw materials. We have our own captive mines. We have a captive mines for iron ore, for non-coking coal. Even though uh, the non-coking coal is a very poor quality, but then we benefitiate it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is something uh, my father, late uh, O.P. Jindal, he really believed in this. He believed that we must control our raw materials. If we do not, then other people are going to control us. So we made a conscious effort to acquire coal mines, to acquire iron ore mines, and even though sometimes they were not the best quality raw materials. And then we invested a lot to make those raw materials suitable. Mm -hmm. And that has really helped us because uh, there has been a lot of volatility in uh, the raw material prices. And you're right, a lot of companies have uh, suffered a lot. And say we did not have, and we still do not have, coking coal, mm -hmm. and because of which we also suffered uh, hugely. 
because prices from $100 per ton suddenly jumped up to $300, $350 uh, per ton. So it's very important to be uh, a player, to have a fully integrated operations that's from the mining till the finished products. Mm -hmm. So sometimes some areas, uh, you know, if it's hurting, then the whole chain, you know, makes you stronger. So one of the things that if any anyone does an analysis of, you know, India's needs right now, infrastructure obviously is a huge one, and your company is obviously cited right in the middle of that in terms of um, steel and energy and stuff like that. Tell me a little about what you see as your company's role in um, the infrastructure improvements. Um, you know, obviously you have an interesting perspective as um, someone who is a head of a company in a private sector, but also as a member of parliament. I believe since um, several years. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you see that, um, you know, the Im infrastructure improvement happening. Okay, I see um, as, from, as far as our company is concerned, Jindal Steel and Power, we uh, want to concentrate more and more. One is uh, steel, mm -hmm. to, uh, to expand our steel operations, to expand the capacity. Presently, we're making 3 million tons of steel. From 3 million, we want to take it to 20 million tons by uh, 2020. So we want to increase the steel making capacity. And then, even more importantly, we're going to give more focus to power generation. Presently, we are generating around uh, 1,500 uh, megawatt of power. We want to take this to around 20,000 megawatt of power. And a lot of power we want to generate from hydro uh, sources so that we are not uh, contributing to global warming or to climate change. We want to generate, there are lots of uh, hydro power potential in the northeast of India. Mm -hmm. And in fact, right now, a company has been awarded one of the, one of the biggest uh, hydro projects, which is 4,000 megawatt. And there is no huge uh, water reservoir. There is no need to do any relocation of people. It's basically a run of the river project, mm -hmm. which is environmentally, which is very, very friendly. So that, but it's a very challenging project. In this northeast that I'm talking about, there are hardly any roads. It's very, it's all, the whole region is very, very mountainous. And there's hardly any roads to be built, to build such big uh, projects. But that's a challenge. That's, um, I want to, we, we have the whole company is going to be working. Mm -hmm. And these projects, one has to work closely with the government also because some infrastructure for these large projects has to be given by the government, especially the, the roads and everything. Mm -hmm. So we are working closely with the government and we hope in the next uh, seven, eight years, we are able to achieve this. So one of the things that you just touched upon is working in some areas, especially in the northeast of India. I think you have some projects in Orissa, for example, yes. right? Yes. So um, can you elaborate a bit on those challenges? Because um, obviously those are some of the places that need the infrastructure the most. And um, especially if you're trying to perhaps source some raw materials or do some projects there, um, you, you really kind of almost need the infrastructure to build the infrastructure, right? Yeah. So talk to us about some of the challenges of working in some of those less developed areas. Okay, most of the uh, times that you're building your steel plants and power plants is really in the areas which are not very developed. So as part of your project, you also have to develop roads over there. You have to bring water. You have to build your transmission lines. So you have to develop the mines, power generation. So all these things when you do, and when you are doing these things uh, in a place where there aren't good facilities, mm -hmm. you have to have uh, good quality education, good quality schools, good quality medical care. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to attract good talent and if you want good people to come and stay in these remote areas, you know, everyone's expectations today are very high. Everyone wants good quality education for their children, good medical facilities for themselves to attract them. Because India offers a lot of opportunities, you know, all over. So when we go to these places, like you mentioned, Odisha or Jharkhand, so we do all these things, building roads, bringing in uh, water pipelines, mm -hmm. making transmission uh, lines, uh, making the townships where our people would stay, and building schools, hospitals, and these things, the, the city also benefits uh, from all this. And uh, there is an issue regarding, uh, because when you want to do set up a project, it obviously uh, it needs a lot of land. Mm -hmm. And in India, land is under a lot of pressure because uh, our huge population is there. 
So we try to look for land which is uh, not very, uh, not high yielding uh, land, not a uh, land with high yield. So, so we try to look for, land. yeah, okay. yeah, non arable land, okay. look for barren lands. Uh, mostly, you can't get it 100%, but we try 75 to 90%, which is barren land. So it's easier, you know, people are then very happy to sell that land. And then also we ensure if you're buying some people's land, even the r and policy of the government of India, that's uh, rehabilitation and resettlement policy of the government, that also wants you to give vocational training to these people so that they could be employed later gainfully in the company. And also you, you build new houses for them, you give them uh, a very good price for their land, and then employment. So it is a win-win situation for all. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a company has been able to, with its work, has been able to build a really good name for itself so that people trust you. And you try to take care of all the stakeholders. So then it's a win-win situation for everyone. So it sounds like your company is involved in quite a bit of projects, so you're really developing the place as well as, um, you know, building some kind of a, um, you know, uh, whether it's an uh, or development or whatever. So what made you um, want to go for parliament? I'm just curious, how, yeah. how did you feel that fit into sort of your strategy um, for life? Okay, it's that's, uh, I joined uh, the parliament, joined, it's the first time that a young industrialist mm -hmm. has joined active politics in the history of India. Uh, that I did drawing inspiration from my late father, uh, Sri O.P. Jindal. Uh, he joined politics when he was 60 years old mm -hmm. because he felt that the poor people, that the underprivileged people, they do not get justice. So, and he said, just being an industrialist, if we, yes, we can make enough uh, money for ourselves, maybe we can work for a million people. If you have a very big business, maybe we can w work for 10 million people but it definitely does not give you an opportunity to work for a billion people. So joining politics for me is part of my strategy to make the country of my dreams. Rather than blaming others, rather than blaming politicians that they have not done this, they have not done that, I wanted to give the best years of my life in making the country of my dreams, in serving the people of my country. And politics does give you that opportunity. So I'm very fortunate that Congress party, especially Mrs. Gandhi, she gave me this opportunity. And the people of Kurukshetra, that's my constituents. In Kurukshetra is a very uh, historic place. That's where the epic battle of uh, Mahabharata was fought. That's where Lord Krishna gave the sermon of uh, Gita. So people there, they gave me their blessings, got me elected. And I've been last uh, six years. Uh, I have been, this is my second term now. So I try to do the best for my constituency and I keep raising issues in the parliament for the youth of the country, about the internal security, about the defense and wherever, uh, whatever best I know, I try to do that. Talk a little bit about the youth because um, you you really are sort of, um, I think, seen as a role model as a young MP. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about India's youth and making sure that the services, infrastructure, education, et cetera, are in place um, because, of course, the youth population is, is growing. Um, what do you see as um, sort of the short-term must-dos in terms of um, the government? You know, what should it be doing to help with that? Right. Uh, Suma, you know that India has a very large population of the youth, and we also do realize that whichever country made uh, you know very fast progress it was during that time when they had a, the largest population of the youth so india is also going through that window of opportunity but we do realize it's only a window of opportunity it's not going to remain like this forever so we have to give good quality education good quality skill sets to our youth so that they can be gainfully employed they can make meaningful contributions to the development of the country. And if we keep our youth unemployed, if they are not able to effectively contribute to the nation's development, then obviously it's, it's unfortunate for them, but it's even more unfortunate for the country because the country would have lost this opportunity forever. So our government, uh, Congress-led government in India, is making all-out efforts to utilize this energy of the youth through we have the biggest plan ever in the history of, uh, of the world, which is the National Rural Guaranteed Employment uh, Scheme, which has already uh, started to give and, you know, um, 
around 400 million people, uh, not 400, uh, 40 million people are, uh, families are getting uh, gainfully employed in this. And a whole lot of schemes are there in place already for giving good quality vocational training. We are making a lot of efforts in good quality primary education in improving the nutrition. So, you know, they are healthy, good quality education, good quality vocational skills. And then the way we are growing, we are going at very healthy uh, GDP growth rate. And I'm sure in the coming years, we'll even touch double digit growth, uh, say around 10% uh, growth rate. So then there'll be a whole lot of opportunities in the in the economy and, and the youth would be uh, ready to take on these challenges and to, to really grow the country. Some years ago, um, you know, you were widely credited with um, um, basically advocating for um, allowing the flag, the Indian flag, to be flown, I believe, um, by any citizen anywhere in the country. Um, you were inspired, I believe, by the fact that you saw students um, here in Texas when you were studying um, flying the American flag. Yes. Um, tell me, how does something like that, a symbol, which the flag is, how does that um, help sort of, um, you know, the country from a business standpoint, from morale, from, you know, the economic morale. What do you see as the importance of that? Why was it so important to you to make sure that the flag could be flown? Uh, when I was in the U.S., I saw people taking so much of pride in being able to display their national flag. Mm -hmm. You know, say to ask an American as to what the flag means to them. You know, flag means a whole lot to them. It's only a symbolic gesture but to see the flag, because uh, when a person displays their country's flag, they rise above their religious affiliations, mm -hmm. their political affiliations, and just show their love and faith in the country. So similarly, in India, we have so many different regions, so many people coming from different, different castes, regions, political affiliations, religious affiliations. So the whole India, all the Indians have to come together as Indians. And the national flag is a symbolic gesture of that. So, like I said, more, I want more and more people to display the greatest symbol of a country mm -hmm. on their homes, offices, and then even more importantly, to live by the ideals of the flag. If everyone does their job well, if I did my job well and others did their job well, you know, there's no power on earth which can stop India from becoming a very prosperous, very happy country. I never use the word superpower or anything because that to me does not uh, mean very much. What we want is that all the Indians to be happy, prosperous, proud. And definitely, uh, the national flag has uh, helped somewhat in achieving that and just bringing a, a kind of a realization that we are first Indians. We first have to work together work in harmony and peace with each other, and together we can achieve uh, good things for the country. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us today.